The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat peer-to-peer. Aloha, buddy. Good morning. Good morning. Buddy. How What's are you? going on, man? I'm great. Hey, uh, congratulations on all the haters and the coattail riders, man. <laughs> We've made it. <laughs> We've made it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Look at him, I guess. I see. I see. We have. He gets so hurt. <laughs> <laughs> we have. We have Arctic waiting for us. So Arctic, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely get you up here at some point. Uh, we just have to. We have to run through the price report, a couple other things. Uh, but honored to have you stopping by today. Yeah. Awesome. Arctic is the man. Yes. 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 <laughs> So yeah, man. So we're super, I am um, super excited okay. to uh, hang out with you. And, I know, excited to meet you. And, me too. Less than a week. Yeah, yeah well, I think we, met we, last, we met him at last Monerotopia. Oh my god, that's right. Yeah. I don't know some of it. That's right. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah but we didn't really get to hang out much. Just yeah, for like I don't right. know, a few yeah. minutes here, a few minutes there. Yes, yeah. that's what I'm saying. I do remember you. You, you gave me some medical advice on my ankle, and that was, that was about did it. I? <laughs> yeah, I was, I was asking. It sounds kind of like me. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about Un- like- unqualified medical advice, something about voodoo flossing, probably. <laughs> Buying stem cells on the black market. Is, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, you're in Mexico. Like, stem cells are pretty cheap. Um, for like $2,500, you can get injected in that ankle. And within a few months, it'll it'll be surprisingly better. See, there you go. <laughs> Look at the- Oh, God. Have you ever done ideas? that? I mean, oh, I- yeah. Really? Yeah, oh. I've I've actually had a few joints injected. Um, like for example, um, I had my wrist kind of messed up when I started boxing a few years ago, um, but I didn't really do anything with it. Um, I also had kind of a knee problem, cartilage cartilage problem from a snowboarding accident years ago. So I did a little experiment where I injected my knee, but not my wrist. And within a few months, my knee was great, but my wrist was still kind of messed up for like I gave it like 15 months. Um, and eventually, I said, "All right, let me go get some stem cells and see if that fixes it." And wouldn't you know? Within two or three months, it was like good as new. Holy shit. Wow. I gotta go. I mean, and this is I wish I listened. I mean, if it if it's been a year. If, if it's been a year, oh, you I still got, have uh you got operated on, man. I had the whole operation. I was in crutches oh, for right. a month, but like I couldn't walk. I mean, I'm I'm back, but yeah, I guess I should have fixed I I I also have a elbow issue, so maybe I will experiment. Oh my god. I really want to see if this, Doug is if this falling works. apart, guys. I mean, I think we both are right. I mean it happens if we go hard. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've even got MRI images on my knee that show that there was significant improvement. Oh, nice. That's awesome. Shit. And it wasn't like a huge, like, it wasn't like a big ACL tear or anything like that. It was just a meniscus thing from, uh, really from years ago. Yeah, I mean, my ankle, without getting into the details, but in the ankle joint, I had a piece of cartilage that was basically chipped off that was missing. So the, mm. the two bones were hitting together. Um, but yeah, man, t- take it away. We digress. Take it away. <laughs> take it away. Okay, so um, if you're on the spaces, I'd recommend that you tune into YouTube. Make sure you select the 1080p so that these charts will make some sense. Um, also, I apologize for whatever reason my microphone is having problems. I think I updated my system like a week ago, and I never checked my mic. So, a- anyways, I'm on my Bluetooth. If I sound a little bit tinny today, no, it's not uh, so okay. Here's here's Monero USD. Um, we've got our final boss line. It just, it's like, we thought he was dead and then he keeps like rising from the dead. I don't know. Uh, if we could just finish him, that would be nice. But, um, anyways, it seems like we're kind of just flirting our way down with this line here. Um, one thing that I thought was kind of interesting is that if you take this line, you can kind of, oops, that's not that line. You can kind of drag it up and you'll notice it's like somehow magically he's it's like, just, it's just sitting there like at a slight level higher. I'm not exactly sure how that works, but somehow I I have a feeling like that kind of thing is sometimes on purpose, especially considering how many resistances all of the other coins or most of the other coins, or maybe I should just say Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, have broken. Uh, But at any rate, I mean, it doesn't look bad, right? Things still look, you know, pretty okay-ish. And in light of the rest of the market, I mean, this still should be fine. Um, We had the the, the money run. I've been trying to figure out how to say that word cooler, like... Money, Monet, Monet run. We had the Monet run. Um, and that, I guess that kind of gave us a little bit of positive price pressure. But, um, you know, you'll notice like the day after things just tanked. So I do wonder if, um, like we had talked about how uh, it looks like Binance and Qcoin had these like huge divergences where they acquired a bunch of Monero. Um, I do wonder if uh, potentially they had done that in anticipation of the Money run just to try and like make sure that they didn't look bad like they did last year. 
Um, and then maybe they sold some of that off uh, at, right the day after the, the run was over. But at any rate, like, I mean, what was that? It wasn't really, I guess, 8%. And I think the rest of the market also kind of dropped there as well. So um, really, I mean, everything looks fine with, with Monero USD price. I'm, I'm not too concerned about it. Uh, we've got uh, Z scores are still kind of positively trending here. So overall, that would kind of paint a picture of at least um, mildly positive action. Um, and, and again, I think I think it's possible we're still contending with the dark webs kind of being shut down and Tor being DDoS and a whole bunch of stuff like that. So there's probably this component of demand that's um, that's not really present that that was present for a long time. Uh, last night we just uh, we just ticked above twenty thousand transactions per day. We've kind of ever since the uh, the fork last year, the upgrade. We've kind of been hiding out just below 20K uh, on the transaction counts. So um, probably someone smarter, some dev guy out there could could explain, you know, exactly why that's taking so long. But maybe it has something to do with bots. Maybe it has something to do with uh, botnets and CPU mining. Or, or maybe that, well, I'm totally out to lunch on that guess. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, um, we could also take a look at uh, Monero versus Bitcoin. And um, we also have positive Z scores on this guy as well. Um, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that this chart is ready to really break out and go to the upside. Um, if we look, let's go to the longer time view for a quick second. Um, so if we kind of draw the, the lifetime uptrend here, you know, we had our triangle, we broke the triangle. We're kind of back down here at this uh, support level. Um, and like I said, as long as the markets in general continue to be positive, I, I kind of expect to have to play in this range for a while. That's just kind of the nature of the thing. So in, in some ways, because of that fundamental dynamic, uh, I'm not like I don't even care. Necess <clears throat> I don't even care necessarily that um, we had this uh, this falling wedge and then we broke that. That it's it's kind of like that the technicals might not matter quite as much as the fundamentals when there's leverage and hype going into the rest of the crypto market, or at least Bitcoin and Ethereum is, is what it seems like for now. There's a few other coins here that are selectively kind of pumping here and there. Uh, but that does kind of tell you about this, the liquidity situation of the market in general. There's probably not that much liquidity to go around. They're focusing on Bitcoin. They're focusing on Ethereum. Uh, and we'll talk about ETH BTC. And, and I think it's important to cover that um, because there's dynamics happening in the crypto market I've been talking about for a while. Um, the evidence of them is continuing to show up. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. So anyways, we broke this uh, we, we broke this falling wedge with momentum and then kind of got stopped out and, and fell back down here into the wedge. Um, I really don't have any strong opinions on where this goes. This is probably something that could really just trend sideways, you know, maybe do this and maybe it doesn't really matter. Kind of dip down, maybe bump up. Who knows? Right. I'm trading the ratio right here. I, I wouldn't have any good advice for anyone doing that. Um, I would just say be wary because it, it is possible there could be more downside, but that's not too much more downside. Like hypothetically, that could be 10 um, percent. I'm sorry, not 10 percent. Uh, looks like from where we're at almost 10 percent right maybe maybe eight nine percent um so you know we'll just have to see play that one by ear um we can also look at xmr versus eth and we've kind of had this downward channel ever since um we broke out of our our sort of bull market that happened against the rest of crypto uh we were in this upwards channel that kind of rolled over and then we broke that down and it's like all right we're we're going down from here um kind of like the zero five uh zero zero Oh, no, sorry, just 0 0.05 level would be pretty good to, to think that we couldn't go any lower. Um, but there's no reason that um, that things couldn't just turn around a little bit right here as well. Uh, again, uh, kind of same story when it's XMR versus ETH versus XMR versus BTC at this moment. I would like to try and say that there's some kind of divergence happening right there. But um, again, the fundamentals probably matter a little bit more than the technicals right here in terms of um, just how the markets are unfolding at the moment. Uh, because it's like XMR, this, this chart is basically XMR USD divided by uh, ETH USD. So if XMR USD is kind of like holding its own and it's flat and they're doing fractional reserve and they don't really want XMR to break out, um, but there's still demand, it's like, okay, it'll kind of like do this choppy thing and it'll, you know, maybe it won't be like going up crazy bullish like the rest of the market, but then with ETH or Bitcoin, they're just pushing leverage into it. The stock market's up. There's some free money flowing, et cetera, right? And then XMR is not going to get that. Well, it's kind of like it kind of doesn't matter necessarily what the ratio is and what the technicals on the ratio say when those fundamentals are playing out. So um, anyways, uh, we're kind of in this downward channel still. This thing looks like it might want to break out. I, I wouldn't necessarily say, oh, my God, that's going to be, you know, an amazing 
uh, restart of the bull market. But, you know, I mean, you don't know, like we, we could easily make some kind of bounce to the upside. One thing that does happen is that um, you'll see suppression. You'll see like a test. And this happens with gold, too. This is a very common thing. In fact, I see so many similarities when I look at gold and I look at Monero. You see these breakouts and then the breakout fails and then uh, and then it kind of like chops sideways and then eventually it goes up some more. And then randomly it'll just bust out like way high and uh, and then it'll, um, you know, they'll, they'll kind of cap it. It's like it's like there's there's real demand, so they have to let that express at some points, but they can kind of control when it when it does express. Um, one thing, one little fun thing I wanted to do, <laughs> I wanted to revisit our, our uh, predictions here, not predictions, but you know, I guess that's what they were, yeah, predictions. Maybe our, our hopes and dreams. Um, so here's our hopes and dreams. I only had 200 as our as my hope and dream. Doug, you were up here at 240 or 239, technically. Yeah, um, I'm exactly on track for that right now. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're gonna need we're gonna need quite the explosion of growth here this week, at least thirty percent, um, maybe okay. up to fifty percent. Okay. I don't know. I give it up yet. Look at Balage, right? He he was a mil Bitcoin at a million in ninety days. What does he got? Like two days left? Or did, did we already? Is it really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, remember that. Well, guy? if we could get him, we should do a CSS to get him to say Monero to a thousand. You know, it's much more realistic. Yeah, no, he's a he's a Zcash guy for some reason. Yeah, mm, suspicious. <laughs> okay, so now you also, I remember you said um, that you wanted to, to take a look at the M2 SL. So I prepared, oops, oh. I prepared a few things. All right, so the M2 money supply, this chart is kind of crowded because of all this extra stuff here, which we'll take a look at in a minute. Um, but this is the M2 money supply, um, currently at about $20.8 trillion. Um, this is a very long-term chart. This is a monthly chart. Um, actually, let's let's start with the tweet. Okay, so um, Nick Jerley, I don't know who he is. Blue check mark. I don't know if that's an eight dollar check mark or a sixty three point seven thousand. No, that's not. That's not native blue check mark. That's a purchased blue check mark. But at any rate, um, so we're looking at the M two money supply growth year over year. So this is a percentage, right? Um, so pretty much since like basically since the Great Depression. Uh, we have had positive M2 growth year over year. So 2022, the year closing 2022 was like the first time we actually had negative growth um, where the M2 supply shrank. And it, it really wasn't that much. So let's take a look. Actually, let's go to the yearly chart here. Okay, so we're on uh, the the yearly. Alt -D. Okay, so in between these lines here, that's how much the M2 money supply went down, which was about 0.95%. Um, this is showing 2%. I, I don't know that maybe there's some slight difference in the way he does you know, like his source or something. Could be that. Um, but at any rate, yeah, so we're saying, okay, could this be a sign of a big depression, a big market crash? I say, yeah, potentially. Um, but I also say the market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. So if you're trying to short this market, because a lot of people out there on Twitter and, and different social media have been saying, look at all these bad signs. The market's going to crash like it's it's terrible. And then the market just keeps going up. So it's like if you've tried to short short that at any point here, um, you know, you're probably not doing so good mm -hmm. unless you like were really good at like closing your shorts, you know, scalping those trades. Because there has been plenty of opportunity to do that, too. Like I've, some guys have talked a lot about shorting, um, but they're also short term traders, you know. So like if you shorted this market almost at any point, as long as you closed your trade when the crash has happened, you would, you would probably be a profit just from shorting. So anyways, um, the thing is that uh, let's go back to the to the monthly here. The thing is that oh, actually, sorry, I take that back. Go back to the to the yearly. Okay, so for right now, for the moment, the it's showing that we're down like four percent, but there's still like there's technically eight more months to go for the rest of the year. But really, as far as the um, as far as this indicator or this chart is concerned, we don't have the data from April first yet. This is just data from March first that came out over the past week. So there's really like nine more months of data to be seen before we can say that this year is actually going to close, you know, down here at this minus 4%. Um, the M2 could start climbing up. Like even let's suppose in um, let's suppose there's some big market crash or like some threat of a crash happening in September, October. And then the Fed comes and intervenes and said, OK, we're just kidding. We'll, we'll print some M2 and save you guys. Um, well, then we could see that come right back here to the zero point. And um, and that would really not be too historically out of trend. Uh, this little point down here is still a bit out of trend. Um, there is risk in this market. I do think the risk in the market is growing. 
I am seeing some little subtle signs um, playing out here, and we'll cover those in just a second. But anyways, the thing that I wanted to mention particularly is that we still have eight to nine months of the year left for this to maybe climb higher. Um, the Fed is saying they don't want to do that, but if push comes to shove and there's like systemic risk in the system, they'll save the system every time. So the other thing I wanted to show you guys on this is I wanted to pull up the M2 for other nations. And so right now we're still on the annual, we're still on the yearly. So you can see um, this is China in orange, Europe in blue, um, Japan is in yellow, uh, and we've got India and Russia in the kind of purple colors. So basically we've got China, India, Russia have all been increasing their M2 money supply for the past year, whereas Japan and the Eurozone have kind of just flattened out. Like they were, they, they're slightly down for this year, but they were actually up for all of 2022. So um, the dollar is actually uniquely going down right here um, for this year, which is kind of an indication of the potential for the Dixie to start performing again. We'll talk about that in a second. If I'm getting too long, just let me know, guys. Um, I could rattle on all day about this stuff, so. No, um, finish, yeah, finish your thoughts. Cool. So, um, okay, so on the bottom here is the percent change from the previous month. So this is this chart is more akin to this chart right here where they're looking at it as a percentage. Um, so overall, you've got, again, China in red, um, Japan in yellow. Sorry, th these colors are actually slightly different. That's just me being schizophrenic or whatever. So China's in red. They're still going up. The U.S. is in white, still going down month over month. Um, and then Eurozone in blue and Japan in yellow. So overall, Eurozone and Japan are kind of flat, as we talked about for this year. They, they've been slightly down. Um, so anyways, that's what the M2 situation looks like. Um, we can go to the Fed's balance sheet. Uh, we saw another drop. So this is where we were last week, and this is where we were after this week. The Fed's balance sheet continues to drop. There's another little signal. Oops. Uh, there we go. Another little signal is the repurchase agreements. This thing has been um, – this is like a crash indicator to me, the, the risk of crash. So we saw it spike up here in, um, in 2008. It spiked up, uh, spiked up again in 2020. And the thing is it spikes up and it stays high. This happened again with the near miss banking crisis, whatever, SVB, Silicon Valley, and um, Signature and all the others, whatever. It spiked up for just a brief moment. And this is basically banks taking kind of emergency loans from the Federal Reserve. Um, and so I saw that spike up. I said, okay, that, that could be bad. I'm going to keep an eye on that. I didn't want to really throw that at you guys just yet. It came back down. <clears throat> this would be a, a counterpoint against um, systemic risk because uh, because that came back down. I'm also looking at the uh, single family home prices uh, for the U.S. And in January, it usually ticks up. But April, like every single April, it almost always ticks up significantly. Like this sawtooth, this is April 1st. Now, we don't have the data from April 1st, but um, this right here, I expect this to sawtooth back up. If it doesn't, that's a pretty negative sign. That's that's really um, that would be a bad sign. So I kind of look at all these things. They're like very long term data. You only get them once a month or sometimes once a quarter. Um, so these are the kind of things I'm looking at to try and determine, hey, when could the top of this market be? Um, let's take a quick look at Dixie here. Uh, this thing is definitely looking like it wants to stop and reverse at some point. We've got like this is very clear divergence, um, positive divergence. It also, in some ways, um, could just be regarded as um, volatility dropping off. So, um, I mean, hypothetically, I, I would like to call this divergence because, um, you know, basically there was lower lows being made, even as higher lows were being made on the Z-score, while lower lows were being made for the price. It's kind of stopped and reversed here. Uh, sorry, not stopped and reversed, but it kind of seems like it stopped, like the support is happening. Um, Dixie has been kind of wild sometimes lately. Like, it looks like it'll do something, then it does the opposite, like right here. It's, we looked and said, hey, this might come up. And then it just for no reason, like there was a, a shooting star wick. And then when that happened, we said, all right, we're going to keep going down. Um, I still kind of like expect to make some kind of wick down, you know, at some point. And actually, if we get a capitulation wick right there, that'll be a really good sign that it's time for the Dixie to start performing, which will also be simultaneously a good sign that we really need to think about um, getting out of the market. So um, I do feel like that time is approaching. It's getting closer. I have been also trying to entertain the potential that the markets could continue positive for longer than I thought. Um, but we're also looking at things like um, the reverse repos, which are now in an uptrend, like they're very clearly in an uptrend. So, um, you know, we, we thought, hey, maybe this thing could keep going down. It, uh, it sort of formed this little bottoming pattern right here, and then it decided to start going up. So at this point, um, you know, I mean, we still want to see, watch this confirm, but if we kind of do something like that, there's a good chance this thing will start going up. 
that doesn't mean that that stocks and, and crypto will start crashing immediately. Um, we saw with the bear market that this thing was going up while stocks and crypto were going up. So there could be like a delayed reaction there. Um, so just know that uh, just know that the signs are like starting to get a little bit unclear. Um, OK, so last thing I want to cover here is Bitcoin and Ethereum. So the thing with Bitcoin and Ethereum is that I think it makes more sense or not more sense, but it makes a lot of sense now to look at them together. Um, so I put them together. I put their market caps on the same chart um, right now. Uh, basically, we're still kind of in this channel, this upper channel. This should be a, a very familiar chart for everyone. Let's go to the daily first, actually. Daily. OK. Um, yeah, so you got your bear market trend line. You've got some of these like uh, important areas of horizontal significance, right? That's the summer. That's the 2021 summer. So we're kind of just playing in that range. Um, at this point, I don't think that we should really ever expect this line to get beaten. Uh, maybe we come up here, we do some of that, but this thing is just grinding higher slowly. If it if if price does spike up above that, be very suspicious, especially if all of our other indicators are starting to say like that, you know, that the end of this run could be near. So that would actually be that would be perfect. Like that would be maximum opportunity to get some crazy spike above uh, above the uh, resistance, along with um, all of our stuff like the Dixie and um, oh, where were we? All of these different indicators that we we're looking at, like the M2 is still going down. Maybe the balance sheet continues to go down. Um, maybe single family homes isn't looking so good, whatever, et cetera, et cetera, with Dixie um, over here where Dixie is like making a clear rebound. Um, that's where we kind of start looking at this and, and saying, OK, like this is a perfect um, confluence of a whole bunch of different things. Um, that's a hypothetical. Just keep in mind, that's that's totally hypothetical. So um, let's go to uh, Bitcoin versus Ethereum specifically. Now, here's the reason why I think this is important for us to keep in mind. The market dynamics are changing. And I know I've been saying this for a long time. Um, you know, ETH is going to flip Bitcoin or gain parity with Bitcoin next bull market. OK, whatever. The important thing here is that a massive stake unlock has been happening for the past two weeks now. And that was supposed to be the thing from all the maximalists that, you know, finally crashes Ethereum right right here. That's when the stake unlock happens. And they're like, oh, it's going to crash Ethereum. and It's over. You know, it's a shit coin and it's going down and, and Bitcoin will save us all. And keep track of your car keys and make you coffee in the morning and, and everything else, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> uh, I just can't help myself. Sorry. Anyways. So, um, but that's not what happened. We saw this thing just take off to the upside. Maybe that was market maker support. Um, there's kind of like this thing going on right here. We could also look at Z scores. Um, Z scores are also trending positively. So um, to me, like there's still stake unlocks to happen over the next two weeks. Um, Bitcoin is currently facing the United States government selling off um, a significant portion of what they have. Um, so remember, they had the Silk Road coins. They had the Bitfinex hat coins. I think overall that was supposed to be 220,000 BTC. They sold 50,000 in March. Um, and then it was, I think, just three or four days ago that coins were moving again um, from like Silk Road wallets and or Bitfinex hacker wallets. So, Yes, ETH has the stake unlocked, but Bitcoin has the United States government selling against it as well. So um, it looks to me like ETH is surviving this massive stake unlock, which had the maximum potential to sell off a billion dollars of ETH. But was probably I read kind of a long article about it and I, I didn't really like only half understand it. You know, like I couldn't really verify the technicals, but he seemed pretty smart. You know, so I said, all right, I'll just, I'll, I'll just trust this guy. It seems like he put a lot of thought into it. <laughs> so um, it seems to me that um, that ETH is surviving this event and that. Like if they do, now that they are surviving this event, um, that's that bodes very well for them, right? Like if they can survive this selling pressure, and it's inherently selling pressure because if you've had your stake locked for like two years, some people have to sell. Um, like one of my friends told me one time, he says, listen, not everybody has to buy, but everybody will have to sell at some point, right? So, so, so the thing is that these people with their stake unlocked, some of them are going to need to sell. Life gets in the way. Things happen. Um, so to me, it just seems that Ethereum is now establishing itself. Proof of stake is viable, even if it's like, I don't know, people can argue about if it's centralized and terrible or not. That's fine. We can argue that. Um, but it is it is surviving and they are still getting OFAC transactions. I think they're up to like, they were at like 90% censorship and now it's only like 60% censorship. Um, I mean, that's not good, but you can still get an OFAC censored transaction on Ethereum faster than you can get a Bitcoin transaction. Um, there's this kind of like broadening structure right here. So it, th this this chart is not out of the woods yet. Like ETH could still hypothetically break down from here, 
but at least it's not looking so potentially catastrophic like it was down here. It, it has a chance, right? It could maybe come up here and then just kind of do that. Um, I'm not saying that's exactly what it will do, but I am just saying that guys know that Ethereum is now a legit solid player in this market. Two weeks from now, after the stake unlocks are finished, if it's continuing this uptrend, this overall sort of macro uptrend against Bitcoin, I mean, Ethereum is looking at gaining market cap parity, and it's got a lot of tokens built on top of it. It's got stable coins and shit coins, and they've got all this market cap. And yeah, a lot of that's fake, but you know, some of that really should be included and integrated into ETH's market cap or considered as part of that. Um, so by the time that Ethereum's close to gaining parity with Bitcoin, it really will have already flipped. And I don't think that's going to necessarily happen this summer or even this year, but I think the next bull market, um, especially if all this stuff with the SEC gets resolved and, you know, they're kind of like attacking shit coins and they're, they're trying to like say everything is a security. And really, this is attack against all of crypto. And I know maximalists don't like to hear that, but the simple fact is a government strong enough to destroy the shit coins you hate will eventually be turned against Bitcoin or your own coin. <clears throat> so it's kind of like, I kind of compare it to the tornado cash. It's like Monero is better for privacy, but listen, we should fight the tornado cash battle. We should we should establish a wide moat far away from us. We should fight them over there because that way we can establish our own legitimacy as beyond question. And so if Bitcoin really is that superior and it's really going to like destroy shit coins, then it can do it with market dynamics and outcompete them. It doesn't need a strong arm government to do it on its behalf because that strong arm government will be used against you later. So um, just know that ETH is is like already kind of gaining a certain kind of mental parity with Bitcoin and you need to keep watching it. You need to really start integrating it into your analysis. Um, so that's my rant on ETH. Sorry for spending so long on it today. But, wow, uh, super ETH bullish. No, I know I know we've been saying it for a long time, right? We we've been we've been having that kind of narrative on this show for a while. And yeah. I, I, I tend to I tend to agree. I mean, uh for all for all the reasons you're saying. Uh, so, so how do you, I mean, do you allocate a portion of your, of your crypto to ETH? I play a lot on ETH. I've got ERC twenties, um, here and there. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Link looks like something that, um, is kind of integrated in a big way. Yes. I know it's centralized. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Lord, forgive me. Lord, try have send. Um, so I have some link, uh, probably just hang on to that long term. Um, I might buy some Ethereum at some point. I've been holding some BTC as well, just cause the dominance chart looks too good. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's smart, like it's smart to probably hold ETH and Bitcoin as kind of like your dominance play, if you will. So okay. it, here's the dominance chart for Bitcoin. Um, Monero, Monero I, only over here, despite, despite, <laughs> despite all these, uh, all the logic. Um, you're a better man than me. Yeah, man. I don't know. I mean, even this, like, I, I agree with you, right? So like, if we'll see how things shake out with the SEC and like you should, people should people in crypto shouldn't be rooting like BTC maxi shouldn't be rooting for the demise of Ethereum because the state attacks it and labels it an SEC. But at the same time, that is reality, right? It has this attack surface. And I think it's, that's a lot of the arguments that, that are made as to why Monero ha has, has such great value, right? Is because it, it has a less attack surfaces than these other cryptos and I've, I've including Ethereum and Bitcoin, you know, um, yeah, for sure. Even labeling it as a security. I mean, I think Ethereum, uh, Monero checks those boxes better than anybody else in, in my mind. The the non, you know, the Howey test. I think Monero really, you know, there's there's really no way to label Monero as a security. I could see the arguments being made for Ethereum, and then obviously, you know, Bitcoin uh, and Monero similarly. Um, but uh, you know, I think that just it's just another attack surface, right? The yeah. state come in and, and attack it through, through regulation, or whatever. Monero, I, a Bitcoin's attack surfaces is a traceable ledger, so I don't know. I, I see, I see the those as weaknesses. I see those as weaknesses. Not that I'm not that I'm rooting for the state to take advantage of those weaknesses, but just being realistic. And I do agree with you, though. Uh, it's probably it makes more sense to fight the fight those fights on those fronts so the fight stays further away from from Monero but ultimately at the end of the day the fight has to be that we have something that the state can't stop right yeah exactly one thing that that um is maybe a little bit disconcerting is that even though Monero falls well outside of any arguments the SEC could make against it as being a security um they've got all the um 
uh, what do they call them? The, I don't know, just the money laundering arguments, right? Where the states, like their, their attack vector is going to be like a whole different vector if they're going to try and attack Monero. And it does sound like they're trying, like the Eurozone is trying to prevent exchanges from holding any coins that are privacy enhancing, anonymity enhancing. Mm -hmm. So we kind of have our own separate battle there as well. And who knows, maybe this SEC attack is kind of a distraction against the privacy attack. Maybe that's what they really want to do is, is hit the privacy coins. Mm -hmm. and yeah. By privacy coins, I mean Monero. <laughs> Good points, man. Good points. Uh, epic price report, as always. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, well, guys, we'll, uh, we'll see you in Mexico City. Yeah, man. We'll, we'll see you very, very soon. Very excited. Let me know if there's anything. I'm bringing a projector with me. Um, it's not very high resolution, but I'm going to bring it. And if there's anything else you guys need from me, um, you know, just let me know. Printing up materials, etc. Okay. Yeah, oh, you don't have to you. trouble yourself with bringing yeah. a projector, man. I mean, don't don't inconvenience because what we're we order. No I'm driving, so it's no yeah. trouble. The equipment. All right. Yeah. You want to throw, throw, you want to throw it in there? I don't know. I you thinking. want to pick up some other stuff? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just hit me up. Just send me a list on Telegram, and I'll let you know what I can do. What time do you, what time, what day do you get there? Um, I was actually planning on, I was going to leave like maybe this weekend, but I don't know. I just decided to leave on Thursday. So what do you timing mean? didn't work out. Oh, okay. But I'll be there Thursday night. Okay. Sweet. Okay. I get sweet. what you're saying. Okay. Oh, nice. All right. Cool. Yeah. That's when we arrive. Yeah, actually, yeah, we'll, we'll reach out to you. We have somebody. We have a few people the, that are going to be out there. Beforehand. The liquor situation is what we're trying to figure out. So basically for the oh. VIP, we want an area where VIPs can go and essentially make their own drinks with their Tumblr swag. Um, so we're trying to trying to figure that out. Maybe you could help us out with that. We just need somebody to help acquire the materials. Hundred percent. That would be that would be a, it. Would be my pleasure to help with that with that awesome. aspect of it. Awesome. I'll bring my sunglasses from the last time as well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Well, be careful. Sneak into the, <laughs> Sneak into the VIP with my old sunglasses. Oh my so god, cool. that's right. That's so funny. <laughs> All right, buddy. All righty. All right. So we'll talk okay. to you offline. Thank you so much. Cheers. Talk to Thank you. you. See bye you bye. soon.